it's a great pleasure to be here um, today and to be talking about inhalers and inhaler use. I guess the thing to remember um, in going through this presentation is that um, in terms of severe asthma, there's very little that has really been done specifically with regards to inhaler technique and asthma. So a lot of the things that we're talking about today have come from a population of patients that have been either in tertiary care or they may have been in primary care or they may have been from pharmacy. But I think you'll see threads in there that very clearly you can extrapolate your asthma. And then in the latter half, there are actually some key, there's some key research that I think in particular relates to severe asthma. So I guess to start off with, the, the assumption when we're talking about inhaler technique is that regardless of which inhaler a, a patient is using, that when we look at the checklist that comes with that inhaler, that a person is able to perform or, or do each of those steps correctly. And certainly today, there is a lot of talk about inhaler technique and, and literally if you look through the guidelines these days, the word, you know, the words check inhaler technique, check inhaler use is really all over the place. And it, it sort of rears its head in all aspects. If you're talking about assessing control, if you're talking about treatment, about whatever area it is. So it's certainly out there. But I think before we, uh, you know, take that for granted, I think we just need to make sure that, you know, everyone's convinced that actually if you do something about inhaler technique, that it is directly related to disease outcomes. Uh, because I think for a lot of time, um, you know, there wasn't compelling or convincing evidence that there was an absolute direct link of that one particular aspect of medication use to outcomes. And so really one of the first studies that was done was one where, where they referred to, you know, they used the word disease stability. But the, the thing to look at here is the proportion of patients, and this is the proportion of patients who had uh, good inhaler technique and how it varied uh, related to their, what they called disease instability. And as you can see, amongst those patients who had the more severe, that were at the more severe end or had the greatest disease instability, as they labelled it, they were the ones, there was less, a smaller proportion having good technique. There was also another study that was done a lot more recently in, um, in COPD, which was a, a biggest, big study, um, which actually looked at exacerbation rate. And what they found was over a three month period, those patients that were able to use their inhalers correctly were basically half as likely to have an exacerbation in a three month period. And in, in 2007 um, was sort of the first study really that was done, which isolated inhaler technique as a intervention point and looked to see what happened with uh, asthma control over time. Now, at the time, asthma control was assessed as severe, moderate, or mild, and it was one of the it was one of the sort of a combination, a combined parameter. But what this study shows that in the group that received education around inhaler technique, the proportion of patients over time, over the months that they received training over time, the proportion of patients who had what was being classified as mild asthma increased. And this was just doing an intervention around inhaler technique. So it was convincing that it definitely had an independent role to play, as independent as a study can show. Now, there's a lot of research that shows that improving inhaler technique can improve to disease outcomes. And so, of course, given the evidence, given the mentioning of this in, in the reports, you know, What's the problem? Well, the problem is that even the most recent data, if we look at the proportion of patients who demonstrate correct technique, in essence, it's still pretty low. And it's, it's low uh, now and it has been low for a long time. And this is a, I, I really like this review, which was published in 2016. And what the authors did was they, I mean, there was lots of different studies and the aim of these studies was not specifically to intervene around inhaler technique, but these studies were monitoring inhaler technique. And it did include both uh, patients with asthma and in COPD. 
but a very large number of patients here. You can see over 50,000 patients. And they categorised patients' inhaler technique as correct or poor or acceptable, and they had their own definition. Um, and we don't need to go into that, but what we need to see main message is that essentially things have not changed over time. So in thinking about this, you know, we need to consider, well, what's going on with these devices? And really, why is it that we can't get our patients to go away and use them correctly? Um, and what are the subtleties and the differences that are important in these devices. And I think it's important to go through some of this because especially as new devices become available, very often the pharmaceutical companies will promote their device has high particles or it has low resistance or it has something else. And I think it's important to consider what are the aspects of a device that we need to look at in its entirety. So the first thing that is that we know is that depending on the different device, and there's just examples of three here. The amount of the delivered dose that actually gets deposited into the lungs varies based on the formulation and the device itself. And so, you know, you, there's not going to be an equal amount that comes out from each inhaler that's actually delivered into the lungs. But of course, dosing takes account of that. What we really need to think about and what you might often hear spoken about when, when um, companies come and talk to you about their devices are really four main characteristics. The aerosol velocity, the aerosol duration, particle size and internal device to resistance. And we're going to have a quick look at each of those. So aerosol velocity really is how quickly does the aerosol come out of the device. So obviously that directly relates to metered dose inhalers. And if we look at data that, uh, which has looked at the aerosol velocity, metres per second of various different metered dose inhalers, CFC, which we don't, we don't have in Australia anymore, the non-CFC, the uh, CFC-free MDIs and the soft mist inhaler, you can actually see that there is a reasonable um, variation in the velocity of that aerosol coming out of the device. I mean, I always think it's fascinating to look at this. This one comes out at eight metres per second, which I just think is so fast. Then we have the aerosol duration. And so this is how long does it take for that dose to be delivered or that aerosol to be delivered? So once again, this is directly related to metered dose inhalers and the soft mist inhaler. And if you look at the research, it once again shows in, in seconds how quickly that dose or that aerosol spends delivering that dose. Then particle size, of course, that determines how deeply a, uh, a, a particle will get into the lungs. And we know that there's a respirable um, range and that this, this, um, this kind of data has been available for a very long time. Of course, this is particle size, the larger particle be uh, higher up in the airways they're going to get delivered and really for the device or the inhalers that we're looking at it really we're looking at this range between one and five uh, microns that is optimal for uh, alveolar region delivery and that uh, and that obviously makes sense and then we have the internal device resistance and that's really the relates to the way in which the air needs to pass through the device during dose administration. And this is only related to dry powder inhalers. Because what happens in dry powder inhalers, if we actually think about this part of the uh, diagram being what happens within the device, and then this is what happens when it's actually coming out of the device, what actually happens is the drug is formulated in such a way that it's really basically clumped together along with excipients, carriers, etc. And it's not possible to formulate particles in dry powder format form, formulation that are so small. They'd stick to the inside of the inhaler and they'd never come out. That's why it has to be formulated sort of in clumps. But what happens before it's actually delivered in a sort of separated uh, drug 
form is that, of course, the patient inhales. And as part of that inhalation process, the particles get, um, these particles get uh, broken up and we get free particles which separates out the, um, the drug. So you have disaggregation that happens as a part of that flow through the inhaler. And different inhalers have different internal resistance. In other words, for different inhalers, a different level of inspiratory flow or effort is required. And so if this is an inhalation profile, the patient needs to inhale deeply and, and uh, as hard as possible when they're um, inhaling medication. Often what we find is that most of that happens in that first bit of the inhalation. That's where the drug gets broken up, or should we say that conglomerate gets uh, dis disaggregated. So the inspir inspiratory flow is very important for dry powder inhalers. And this is just a uh, graph which looks at flow rate and the inspiratory effort for different devices. And you can see it varies. For some devices, like the turbi inhaler, you'll actually, the patient needs to use more effort um, as their flow rate increases. So that's an important consideration. So when we come back to this and the fact that manufacturers have determined that in order to uh, administer the optimal drug delivery dose, there's a certain number of steps. It's important to consider what errors are common versus what errors are actually critical. Because for many years, we said patients need to do all these steps correctly because we didn't have the evidence to really definitively say which one of these steps if the patient didn't perform it correctly, was directly related to a clinical outcome. So this is a study that looked at metered dose inhalers and several dry powder inhalers, and it looked at the different types of errors, and different studies will show a lot of variation in different errors. And so the types of errors that we see are errors that might be associated with preparing the device, errors that might be associated with how the device is positioned, errors that are associated with the breathing manoeuvre, and errors that are associated with coordination. And of course, not all of these apply to every inhaler. And we know which errors the patient uh, is more likely to do because there's lots of research that looks at common errors. The other thing that's important to remember is that regardless of which device we're looking at, Patients will often make more than one error, any one of these. So they're likely to, in fact, if you look at any of these devices, um, most of the patients are making more than one error. The question is, which error is critical? Does it matter whether a person makes what, a particular error or not? And there's there's only one really comprehensive study that looks at which particular inhaler device errors result in an impact on clinical outcomes, so asthma outcomes. And this was a study which involved 5,000 patients, but there was only a large enough sample size to be able to do analysis on three devices, the turbohaler, the acuhaler, and the meter dose error, the meter dose inhaler. And as you can see here, these were the list of steps that were identified as being related to asthma control. So if patients were making these errors, they were more likely to have poor asthma outcomes. However, in addition to that, patients may have also been non-adherent and a whole range of other things. So when you take out all other confounding errors, we get left with a limited number of errors, and they are the preparation of the dose and inspiratory effort for the derby inhaler, inspiratory effort for the acuhaler, and head positioning and coordination of the inhalation and actuation. So out of all the errors that are there, this study was actually able to articulate that these are the errors that, are partic that in particular are related to disease outcomes. So 
even if we know everything about the device, we, we know how to train patients, we know exactly what we're getting, how does the patient fit into this? And obviously, there are patient characteristics that are going to impact on inhaler technique. So there's a very, very intimate relationship between the patient and their device. And that might be related to their physical ability to use it, or the, if they have a disability, their dexterity, their inspiratory effort. And I'd like to put here also how consistent it is and what happens over time and their cognition. So let's have a look at some other things that are important. The other thing that sometimes gets taken for granted with inhaler technique or inhaler use, and Tim's going to go into adherence, but for a patient, you know, it's essentially how they use their inhaler, is also this idea of what are they, what do they believe, where they where they believe their condition is at and how poorly controlled, et cetera. Now, I know today is about severe asthma, so I guess in some ways, if we just look at the data that looks at those people who have poorly controlled symptoms, which is the grey bar here, and it's also um, on this graph, it's actually um, this one here. What we find is that 50% of people who have poorly controlled asthma think that their asthma is well controlled. And so patients are not going to probably come and say, well, we've never heard of patients coming to say to us, my device isn't working properly or I, I have problems with my device because they may not necessarily recognise it. And also they have beliefs about their medications and we've got some data to show that that impacts on their inhaler use. First of all, we know that there's, there's a high proportion of patients who don't take their medication every day and that, that can range from 20% if you look at some community studies all the way up to 60% who may be taking their inhaler regularly. And then they also have other issues around it. They find it a nuisance, they feel embarrassed about it, they feel embarrassed carrying it around and a small proportion actually might say that it's difficult to use. And we also know that they are talking to other people about their medications. So while 80% of them are talking to healthcare professionals, but about 60% of them are sourcing information online, and about a quarter of them are talking to family and friends, and then there's other things here. And we did some research on this group here, which looked at their family and friends, and actually the kinds of things that they were talking to family and friends about were things like, what dose should they take? So really quite significant things that relate to their inhalers. The other thing that we know is that almost three quarters of patients perceive their inhaler technique to be good or excellent. And 86% of them will say that they find it easy to use. And anecdotally, we've had a lot of feedback from pharmacists who tell us that even though they might want to ask the patient again about their use of their inhaler, the patient is quite resistant to that. And so they find that as a barrier to uh, education or identifying pro problems. And there's a lot of research looking at patient preference um, and patient choice. I mean, you know, a lot of the recent research that looks at does a patient preference for an inhaler or their choice of in, having a choice for their inhaler relate to them using their inhaler properly? I think there's a lot of in, inherent bias in that study, those studies. So I'm not really convinced. And, and another bit of research that we did a few years ago actually showed that very few patients actually get a choice of their inhaler and, or, and they don't seem to really have a preference because they don't think of the inhaler separate to their medication management overall. And then there's some research also that shows that if you look at whether it's the device, whether it's patient related factors, whether it's education related factors, that motivation is a really important part of patients actually using their inhaler correctly. And something that impacts on their inhaler use, which people usually associate with adherence, but we've actually found that there's a link to inhaler technique, is about also their concerns and their necessity, their, their belief of the necessity used to use the medication. And concerns we've found is a much bigger problem than what we actually uh, have traditionally thought, I guess. In this study that was a community-based study, 
and we asked about uh, side effects. We found that up to, so the, the red lines are those patients who had poor symptom control and the dark line is overall. And you can see that actually a high proportion of patients are experiencing side effects, hoarse voice being up to 65% of those with poorly controlled uh, symptoms, 50% cough, 30% uh, sore throat, mouth, uh, oral thrush, 20%, etc. So if they've got concerns, they are there. And so they're really not thinking about this in the way that we are. So is there an ideal device? Well, if you look at what constitutes an ideal device in amongst the literature, there are so many different things that are listed as, as contributing to the ideal device, and it depends on whose perspective. So some of the things listed are very technical things. Some of the things are simple to use and teach, I mean, and I'm still not really sure what that actually means. Some of them are related to practical things like that the device has got a dose counter, um, that no priming is required. So, I mean, I think the bottom line is there isn't an ideal device. It's just us making the most of what we actually have. And so what are some other considerations and perhaps particularly what are some other considerations when we look at patients who have severe asthma? And I think that there's really three that we need to think about. The inspiratory flow, polypharmacy and previous experience with devices and what impact that has on how people use their inhalers. So going back to inspiratory flow, I mean, you, we, we, we pointed out sort of earlier that in that study that looked at those critical errors, inspiratory effort um, and it being insufficient was a key problem with the dry powder inhalers. In fact, when we look at this data more closely, we can see that those patients who are unable to generate uh, sufficient inspiratory flow are at increased risk of poor symptom control, but they're also at increased risk of exacerbations. So there's clear evidence that that is an issue and that is logical. There's another bit of evidence that sort of we can gain more insights into inspiratory flow. And this was a study that was actually looking at two dry powder inhalers, one which was new on the market. And it was the aim of this study was to actually see whether some of these newer inhalers are you know, in inverted commas, easier to use or perhaps more intuitive to use or, you know, as a healthcare professional, we can we can be more confident that if a person is using this inhaler, there's less likely to be a problem. And the bit of this, and, and so all of these patients were actually tested on both a turbohaler and on a Spiramax. And so this is just an overview of what the study design was. And it was a crossover study. So they got to use both inhalers and then they uh, went off and after 12 weeks, they were tested again. And what I'd like to point out here is that in this group of patients, inspiratory, uh, the inhalation, inspiratory flow, um, not being as fast as possible or being an error was uh, prevalent in about 15% of patients. So that's from this particular study, which was a study in primary care. The other study, which really highlights the um, issue of inspiratory flow it was a study that was done in tertiary care and I think this becomes starts to become more interesting and this was um, we're going to get to this Inca device a little bit very soon a little bit later on but this is a device that actually was um, developed by uh, Richard Costello who is a respiratory physician in in Dublin and he I think it's a great story he was working with uh, his schoolmate who was actually an engineer, audio uh, engineer, and together they developed a add-on device uh, which was, which you can put on a accuhaler at the time, which through audio could determine whether a patient was actually performing each step of the inhaler use correctly. And when they looked at this group of tertiary care patients, the most common error was actually inspiratory flow, and that was prevalent in just under half the patients. So 
how does that then relate to uh, the devices? Well, I think if we then look back and map inspiratory flow with device characteristics, what we can see is that it really does relate to three of the fundamental technical characteristics of devices. The first one is the aerosol velocity and the aerosol duration for the metered dose inhaler, because actually for many of these devices, it means that the patient is able, and then the internal uh, device resistance, which means that for some devices, it's about that first forceful inspiration being sufficient. For some of these other things, it's about being able to sustain that while the dose is delivered. So the next thing is polypharmacy. And how does polypharmacy relate to this? Well, we know that many patients over the age of 70 um, have got multiple medications. And really, we haven't, there hasn't been much work done in what happens when you have polypharmacy in terms of devices, but there are, there is some key research. The first one actually has been done in severe asthma, and it's been done by our Newcastle colleagues, where they were looking at treatable traits and identifying which ones of these um, were relevant for severe asthma and were associated with predicting future risk. So they identified 24 treatable traits and they related to a whole range of parameters. And what's of interest to today's presentation is that out of the 10 traits that were associated with increased exacerbation, one of them was device polypharmacy. So if patients were using three or more different inhalers. And that is not at all surprising because we know that patients need to have different technique for different inhalers. And unless they know which is appropriate for which inhaler, you can see that they're going to start to get into trouble. There's also um, the issue of uh, continuing on in terms of multiple inhalers. And um, what we know is that if we just think of this, patients are going to have experience in using more than one type of device. So what's going to happen if they've been using one particular device, then they switch to another device, and then another device is added on, et cetera, et cetera. What is the impact of switching? And what is the impact of adding on? So we did a study um, a couple of years ago, which looked at, it was once again looking at how intuitive devices were to use. But this study method actually allowed us to look at what happens when you switch devices. So this was a study that um, in which uh, patients were naive to, or users were naive to the device. And then they were, they first used one device and then they were switched onto another. They were randomised into which device they used first and it was dry powder inhalers. And so once they'd had one device and they had an error, we actually looked at different levels of instruction to see how much instruction they needed to get. But the bottom line is when they were asked to use a particular inhaler, we kept on training them until they could use that inhaler and then they went to the next inhaler. So what did we find? And this was a longitudinal study, but I'll only show you the results for visit number one. So what did we find? So this is when they first used the inhaler without uh, any training. This is intuitive use. We've labelled it as intuitive use. So when they used the Turbuhaler first or second, which is the blue, or when they used the Spiromax first or second, which is in the grey. So when they first picked up the Turbuhaler and used it 1%, of the sample was able to use it correctly. But if they'd used another inhaler first, were trained and then went to use the turbuhaler, 12% of participants were able to use the inhaler correctly once they'd been shown how to use the other dry powder inhaler first. And similarly with the other, with the second dry powder inhaler, 9%, and then that went to a third of them. So the bottom line is there is a carryover effect and patients will remember something from a previous inhaler and will probably carry it over. Another study that looks at multiple inhalers is a study that we 
we did looking at a COPD population this time. So this was an observational study and this was from data that was collected in uh, a, a sample of a database of 71,000 patients. And we divided those into patients who were using uh, or uh, using switching devices, but devices, oops, devices that were either similar via looking at some of their use characteristics or whether where they were mixed, they were different. And so this is looking at similar, those that were put on similar and those that were switched. And what and here we look at some uh, outcomes, you, acute use of oral uh, corticosteroids, antibiotic use, uh, SABA use and uh, consultations related to COPD. And what you can see is that patients who were switched on similar to device that was similar were better off in terms of these particular outcomes. So there's definitely something about what people have used before and what they are using and, and getting the technique. Now, I'd just like to finish off by looking at um, where we're at in terms of a particular study which I think is very interesting in terms of severe asthma because that's what it actually focused on. And this is this Inca device. So this was, was done by Richard Costello and his colleagues in Dublin. And this is how the device actually looks. Um, and they have now um, developed it for some other inhalers. And what you can see is the, the de Inca device is put on the inhaler and then the patient uses the inhaler and they get an audio output, which they have developed algorithms and it can relate to whether the use of the inhaler was correct. So this is actually a technique, which is really brilliant because we really haven't had anything like this. And that's exactly what we need to really understand how people are using their inhalers because there's also you know, a, a, a bit of, or potentially a lot of bias when we're observing people use their inhaler as well. And that is not ideal. So this is really what we're looking for in the future. And so the output that you get from this, when you look at, so this is what the output of use, what the Inca device does is it both timestamps and it also um, indicates whether the dose was taken correctly in terms of technique. And of course, this is the ideal patient taking their uh, medication twice a day at the right time and with the correct technique. This is more a sample of what happens in real life. So this was some outputs from patients that were discharged from hospital. This particular sample was from COPD, but I think it's still very interesting to look at this. And as you can see, the timing is all over the place. The yellow suggest, shows whether the, the patient actually used correct technique. So this patient here, graph number uh, um, figure C, they were taking it, they seem to be taking it quite a lot, but it was very rare that they were actually taking it correctly. E shows someone who religiously takes their inhaler every day, twice a day, but as you can see, most of it is incorrect and then you have everything in between. So but the particular study that is, is of relevance here is this study that was done to look at uh, inhaler technique, and in this case, of course, also adherence because of what they can monitor for patients who had severe uncontrolled asthma, because this was to try and determine which patients would, if we if we corrected everything we could, which patients really did end up needing to go on, have add-on treatment or alternative treatment. And so the inclusion criteria was patients who were coming into the specialist clinic were on step three or above uh, GINA, had at least one exacerbation with uh, oral corticosteroids in the previous months and had uncontrolled symptoms. So there was a variety of uh, parameters that were, were measured. These were all patients that were on, sal, uh, on a salmeterol fluticasone uh, combination. And the output was looking at errors that they made and dose administration. And so what, what and this is actually looking at biofeedback as in showing patients the graph um, or giving them intense education. But what I'd actually like to show you here, so I, the things that I want to point out here are the things that I've highlighted, and that is to show you who this population actually 
uh, is. And so these are patients who were using on average up to just under four uh, short, short courses of oral steroids in the previous year. This is the dose of um, the cell meter of fluticasone that they were on, the proportion that were on these. This was the proportion that were on um, uh, Montelukast and also on Alama. So this gives you an idea of that the population. And what did they find? And I've highlighted down here what, it, what is the most significant finding. So I have to acknowledge that they found that by giving patients uh, visual feedback, um, after three months, they found that 73% of them could use their inhalers correctly compared to intensive um, education. But the other interesting thing is this. By the end of the study, which was a three-month study, asthma was either stable or improved in 38% of those patients who had previously had uncontrolled, but they were poorly adherent. And it was uncontrolled, but they had good use of their inhaler in 27%. So the bottom line was that that in the end, after improving their use of their inhaler, they were able to find that 27% of their patients still required some sort of add-on therapy. So these devices that help us improve technique are hopefully going to really help us in being able to determine which patients their problems are related to inhaler technique and which ones require treatment. And actually, a lot of them were fixed with improvement in the use of the medi medication. So we end on, the good news is we can train patients how to use their inhalers. The bad news is we seem to have to continually do it because when we come in, there's a low proportion of people who use their inhaler correctly. We can train everyone or most people to use it correctly. When we bring them back, people drop off and people have got errors and we've, we've seen this consistently. But we're hoping that these new, uh, the new technologies are going to help us. So where does it leave us? Well, I think at this stage it leaves us with, we can probably assume that a lot of people are going to have problems with errors. Inspiratory flow is something that, you know, we, we acknowledge that it's going to interact with the device in a major way. And we really have to try and think of how we can uh, prescribe inhalers that are less affected by inspiratory flow. Um, we don't rely on a patient coming forward and polypharmacy and these learnings are going to be important when patients start using a new inhaler. And with that, I'd like to finish off. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for an excellent presentation. I hope that my microphone is working better now than it was at the beginning. Are you hearing me fine, Cynthia? Perfect. I can hear you perfectly now. Fantastic. So uh, we're right at the 40-minute uh, mark. I was wondering, there's one question so, in, the, in the panel online so far. I wondered if you could just speak really quickly to... Uh, um, the issue of uh, what you mean when you're discussing uh, GINA control levels and uh, in relation to inhaler device use. Um, so, it, it, in I mean, is that um, in terms of the GINA questions that are recommended for um, determining control? Is that is yeah, that what you mean? Or? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of these studies, what they try and do is they try and really relate to the gene of questioning about uh, symptom control um, to try and just so that we, we have some data which is universally accepted in terms of how we're assessing symptom control. So, um, I mean, that's, that's what we're relating to. And, um, you know, because the symptom control is really a snapshot, um, a lot of the times that's all that we really have um, in terms of inhaler technique and when people come back. But we, but we, of course, are trying to look at future risk as well. And, you know, that that's, we're evolving in terms of that. And some of these studies also look at, you know, are looking at future risk. Thank you for that, Cynthia. And I think uh, now we'll we'll save uh, the rest of the questions and discussion for, discussion for uh, after Tim's uh, presentation here. Thank you again, Cynthia, for your presentation. Pleasure.
So now I'll introduce the uh, second talk for uh, this session. Uh, Tim, uh, Professor Tim Usherwood is a professor uh, of general practice and head of Westmead Clinical School at the University of Sydney. And his research focuses on development and evaluation of uh, interventions to improve health outcomes in chronic disease. Uh, so today he'll be speaking to the topic of treatment adherence uh, in, in asthma and respiratory disease. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Stephen, very much. And thank you, Cynthia, for a fascinating talk. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land that we now call Australia and their, um, their elders past, present and emerging. So the, this year's uh, GINA report on difficult to treat and severe asthma in adults and adolescents um, and with advice on diagnosis and management notes that in many cases, asthma may appear to be difficult to treat because of modifiable factors such as poor adherence and also, of course, poor inhaler technique, as Cynthia has highlighted. Looking at adherence, at adherence there are really three groups of reasons why um, people may um, adhere poorly to their prescribed medications. They may intentionally decide not to um, use the medication there may be personal attributes that make it difficult for them to use the medication, or there may be ex external constraints that limit. With intentional poor adherence, which is poor adherence that reflects a decision or ambivalence by the patient. In the case of asthma, um, uh, Juliet Foster and her colleagues at the Wilcock Institute um, did a study some years ago uh, looking at patient-specific beliefs and behaviours for con conservation, conversations about adherence in asthma. Um, they studied um, 100 patients and uh, those 100 patients were um, asked to complete a questionnaire about their, um, uh, their, um, uh, their, their views on, 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 on their, medica their inhaler medication. I should say that all those patients were on um, a combined inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist. So they were asked their views about their medication. Uh, they were asked at the end of a, um, of a um, follow-up period also to report their adherence. A factor analysis of the um, patient's reported views on adherence identified uh, seven groups of factors. People might not use their, their, their um, inhaler because they um, didn't perceive it as necessary for their asthma treatment, because they expressed uncertainties about um, the effectiveness of the inhaler, because they had safety concerns and worries about the safety, long-term safety of their inhaler. Following advice from family and friends, and perhaps these days, perhaps things seen on the internet, um, limited motivation to use their inhaler, limited satisfaction with asthma management, and finally, perceived, um, limited perceived, perceived ease of use. And I guess that those factors identified in Juliet's study were similar to those that, that um, Cynthia has, 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 has uh, already spoken about. But notice that many of those factors associated with poor adherence were not about inhaler skills, they're actually about attitudes to, um, towards and beliefs concerning their inhalers. So that this was, this was, these were examples of reasons for, um, for intentional uh, poor adherence. Poor adherence due to personal attributes relates to, again, MDI skills or um, metadata inhaler skills or, or other, other inhaler skills. Um, forgetfulness or cognitive impairment by the patient. Depressive illness is well known to limit or to reduce adherence to medication, presumably operating through motivation to, to use the inhaler, but perhaps also through forgetfulness and the known impairment of cognition that occurs in depressive illness. And poor understanding of treatment plan. Again, um, so these are, these, are the re these are reasons why people may have reduced adherence and, uh, and their, their personal um, attributes of the patient. Finally, there may be um, reduced adherence to, due to external constraints. 
Um, so cost is an important um, uh, um, barrier to adherence for some people. And I'll just take you to the next slide for a moment and show that um, this is an impact, the impact of cost on, um, on uh, adults collecting prescribed medications, not just asthma. I couldn't find anyone, any relating specifically to asthma, but across all prescribed medications, um, the, uh, the higher your index of disadvantage, uh, the higher your probability of not collecting prescribed medications due to cost. Cost is an important barrier to, um, to adherence. Other external constraints on adherence. Um, so other access difficulties, just difficulty getting to the pharmacy. And also regime complexity. And I think that's an important external um, constraint that uh, Cynthia's mentioned, and really in the context of of treating asthma with um, metered dose inhalers, there are three components to that. There's the um, number of inhalers prescribed, and Cynthia identified that um, more than two reduces adherence. There's the um, frequency with which the inhalers need to be used. And there's also the fact that if you have inhalers that require different techniques, so perhaps an aerosol driven metered dose inhaler versus a dry, and plus a, a dry polar device, a dry powder device, so the patient needs to use two different inhalers with two different techniques, then, then that can, um, is associated with reduced adherence, or at least reduced um, effective use of the inhaler. So against that background model of, of, of reasons why a patient's adherence to their medication might be limited, might be poor, then um, how do you detect it? Well, I think the first in, most important point is ask. You should ask at every consultation. Um, and it's important to ask in a collaborative way, um, using the patient's own expressions. If the patient talks about my puffer, then that's the word to use. And, uh, and it's valuable to normalize poor adherence. For example, um, uh, patients often have difficulty, or people often have difficulty remembering to use uh, their inhalers every day. Um, is, is, would that be true for you? It's also important to ask specifically about missed doses. So in the last week, has there been an occasion, has there been a day when you've um, forgotten to use your inhaler? Other opportunities for detecting poor adherence are rev review of prescription records and terms of dispensing records. Going back to that study that I mentioned earlier by Juliet Foster and her colleagues, um, not only were patients asked their beliefs about their inhalers and um, to self-report their um, use of uh, their inhalers, their adherence, but they're also asked to complete um, a formal adherence behaviour score, the Morrisky score. And in addition, each, each patient's um, uh, in, inhaler, their, their combined ICS and SABA, uh, sorry, LABA inhaler, had a, a small metering, uh, monitoring device attached to it that actually measured each time the, the inhaler was discharged. Now, patients obviously knew that that device was there. It wasn't told them that they were monitoring their their um, uh, their adherence, but um, they were advised that the device would keep track of their treatments. So they might have had some insight that uh, this device would be um, tracking their use of their inhaler. And you'll see there. Um, on the left, a um, comparison of the um, electronically recorded adherence with self-reported adherence, and on the right of electronically reported, recorded adherence with the Morrisky score. Looking first at the graph on the left, the um, uh, labelled A, then it's clear that there was a group of patients who had poor adherence, but nevertheless self-reported 100% adherence. Um, so some people, for whatever reason, won't report limited adherence of their inhaler. But of those, amongst those who didn't self-report 100% adherence, then there was a fairly good correlation between electronically reported, recorded adherence, objectively recorded adherence, and self-report. There was actually a correlation between the Morrisky score and electronically recorded adherence as well, but it was far less marked. So asking the patient is an important strategy but if patients claim 100% adherence, that may or may not be true. 
So having identified that adherence may not be um, 100%, one needs to diagnose, we need to diagnose the reasons. And again, that model of intentional poor adherence, per personal attributes impacting on adherence and external constraints provides a useful guide. Once one has, a, uh, having identified in intentional poor adherence, then what are the, um, uh, what are the, interventions available. Well, patient education, addressing the concerns raised by the patient. They have concerns about um, effectiveness that can be that can be discussed. They have concerns about side effects or potential side effects um, that can be discussed. So patient education is important. Printed handouts can support patient education. There is evidence that shared decision making, working with the patient to work out what are the optimal management um, strategies for this patient. Um, is valuable and, and, and not and, and underused. And motivational interviewing has also been shown in some circumstances to be helpful intervention to address limited adherence. In terms of non-intentional poor adherence, that's personal attributes and external constraints, then what are the opportunities? Well, Discuss regime complexity. If it's possible to reduce the regime complexity, that's valuable. Perhaps reduce the number of inhalers to no more than types of inhaler to no more than two, and to make sure that they're both of a similar type. It's not always possible, but it's ideal. Uh, written asthma action plan, um, often seen as an intervention to assist with with um, with uh, exacerbations, and of course that's important. Um, and there's evidence to support that, but also it provides a, a guide and a reminder to the patient to support to their routine use of inhalers. Um, worth recruiting uh, support from the pharmacist. Uh, and in fact, the pharmacist, the prescribing doctor and other members of the care team should work together with the patient. Reminders, um, setting the phone as a reminder twice a day to, to use the inhaler. It's been shown to be beneficial, at least over a period of times and weeks. And there is emerging evidence um, of the text messaging as a way of, of reminding people to continue using medications and, and to um, uh, and, and, um, and, and to adhere to their, their prescription. And finally, and I think I would uh, reiterate what um, Cynthia said, checking inhaler technique is really important and it's really something that prescribers should do at every consultation. It's ideal of course as a dispenser, the pharmacy pharmacist can do so as well, but it's an important uh, um, job for the prescriber. So just to conclude, um, to note that uh, um, in um, a cohort of patients with asthma, then at least um, 25% uh, will be undertreated um, and uh, will have uncontrolled symptoms with no preventer or poor adherence. But in fact, the data suggests that up to 50% or more of people with chronic illness, including people living with asthma, um, have poor adherence. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for that, Tim. Um, so I'll just switch to the view here on this slide. Um, and uh, I'll now invite uh, questions from the audience uh, here in, um, in, in Newcastle as well as online, which I'll facilitate. Um, I guess I, I, a first question that I'd like to ask here is, um, I was struck, um, I guess, from both perspectives, but particularly with Cynthia's presentation, um, the fact that so few uh, uh, individuals, uh, when first given the device, it was it intuitive, as well as what a large drop off there is in um, in, uh, a, in the ability to use it on the second section. I, I wondered, is there any movement to improve the general design of the the device in the first place to make it more def more uh, more readily uh, usable? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the uh, manufacturers or, you know, the, the pharmaceutical engi the engineers in the companies are trying really hard to develop a device which, which is impossible to use, to make a mistake with. But, you know, as you can see, it's, it's a really complicated, actually, 
device. The devices are very complicated. You've got the complication of the formulation and how the formulation fits into that device. And then you've got, you know, the interaction with the patient. So I think they're striving to, and you know, some of them are saying you only need three steps, et cetera. But I don't think that we have seen yet in practice or in evidence what difference that might be making or whether it's making any difference. I don't think we've seen that yet. We don't know whether we will. Fantastic. Uh, we had several questions from the online audience uh, in relation to the use of spacers. Um, and I guess that uh, potentially could apply both to the technique, obviously, but also adherence. Um, maybe Cynthia first, what can you say about the use of, uh, uh, of spacers with metered devices? Yeah, well, they are def they definitely improve lung deposition. So they definitely improve the overall um, use of that inhaler and the, you know and the appropriate medication deposition. Definitely. So I mean, using MDI meter dose inhalers and the coordination, it is very tricky, and um, people do need practice at that. And then you can tell that if they're not feeling well or they're panicked and they need to take a dose or whatever. That, that's going to play into all of that. So the spacer definitely should be the recommendation. We know in practice that people don't necessarily like using their spaces, so that's another challenge. But in terms of technique, definitely that is the recommendation. And I, I guess Tim, from the uh, adherence side of things, maybe do you want to comment on uh, on spacers? Well, I guess that um, we know that one of the barriers to people's use of inhalers is embarrassment and uh, using the thing in public. And um, obviously, if that involves having a spacer attached to the inhaler, then it's even more obvious. Um, another issue with spacers is that um, uh, you may not be always using your inhaler in the same place at the, uh, in the morning and evening or, or otherwise during the day. And so um, I, I've certainly had patients who who bought themselves two or three spaces to keep in different places, um, but then again, that's an inconvenience and a, and a cost, and so not always um, so easy. Right. Do you have any questions from the audience here? No. Any further questions online? I wondered if I could put you each on the spot at the uh, finish here, if, if you could uh, sum up kind of two or three take home messages about, you know, if, if you can't address or deal with everything, what what's the what's kind of the, the best bang for the buck uh, uh, approach to, to hit in, in each of the topics you've covered? Maybe Cynthia first. Uh, check regularly. <laughs> And, and check regularly and and um, keep reminding patients or keep you know refining until that until that uh, correct technique becomes a habit. And Tim, uh, always ask about adherence every consultation. Um, uh, don't necessarily believe the answer you hear first time. Uh, ask more specifically, um, and be willing to work with the patient. And, and, and listen to their concerns, their beliefs, and, and work with them about um, what's, what's, what's optimal for them. And like Cynthia, and always, and always check the, um, uh, the um, patient's uh, skills with, with, with each of the devices they've been prescribed. Excellent. Well, if we have no further questions, uh, please uh, join me and thank you both Cynthia and Tim for an excellent presentation.